In this discussion, experiential anthropologist and clinical nutritionist Mary Ruddick shares when and where she uses organ meats in her own life and her client practice to nurture herself and her patients. In the first half of this discussion, we talk about when organ meats may not be appropriate in her clinical practice and how to move toward them in these situations. And then about halfway through, we shift gears from the clinical setting to explore Mary's experience consuming organ meats on her diverse travels with traditional cultures. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Welcome to the Diaries at Awfully Good Cooking, and I'm super excited to welcome Mary Reddick today. Mary Reddick is both an experiential anthropologist going around the real world, traveling to the most traditional, uh, untouched traditional cultures, but also is a very practical uh, nutritionist that has been working in a practice for many years with the most difficult cases, uh, debilitating chronic conditions, um, neuromuscular diseases, and other cases that the conventional doctors would say are untreatable. So and has had amazing results. So I'm really excited to tap into your knowledge with respect to nutrition and, uh, and kind of clinical purposes of organ meats, but also to hear about some of your insights from your travels around the world. So thank you for being oh, here, thank Mary. You. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. <laughs> All right. So let's dive in. Tell me just some of the cultures that you've been to that kind of where have you seen organ meats in the most prolific use that are the most common, the most revered, the most special, or maybe the most, like maybe some, I know you've been in so many places where you've seen this, but maybe the places that have touched you the most. If it's... Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the organ meats uh, and many more organ meats than we tend to use, even when we're conscious to use them in the States or consume them in the States, uh, really all the organ meats and the glands are consumed in each of the cultures that I go to, but there are different traditions and patterns and quantities and things like that. So where I see the most use is in high elevation, which makes sense, mm -hmm. right? If you're in the Peruvian mountains, if you're in the uh, mountains between China and Mongolia, it, you don't have as much oxygen and the organ meats bring a lot of oxygen. So, so the organ meat is typically consumed on a much higher rate than I would see in each of the other cultures. Wow. I'm also curious uh, about the patterns of like eating raw organ meats versus cooked organ meats and even preserved and dried. Have you seen things like that? No. It was so interesting when you sent me a message about that. I have not seen the preserved and dried, but it doesn't surprise me. I typically see a lot of cultures that either eat some of the organs raw or that they then cook them right away. And there are patterns to it. So for instance, many of the places that I go to, I'd have to bring out my chart of research to give you an exact answer, but many of the places that I go to, the pregnant women will eat liver uh, and even raw liver up until the last trimester. And then it's pretty rare to have the raw liver at that stage. And so they, I bring that up because it's, it's interesting and it's contradicting everything else that I see. I know in the States and, and around the globe, we tend to promote this idea of don't eat egg yolks, don't eat raw fish, don't eat all these things. But the traditional cultures with their perfect health and perfect birthing and all of that, they don't have those beliefs and they don't follow those. So there's a lot of raw food still consumed, especially if it's a culture that does that. And that would be one of the few exceptions. I would say many, not all, but many of the places I've been to, last trimester, usually the raw is not consumed. Uh, and then a lot of organs after the birth, typically to build up the blood again. And not just liver, you're saying a lot of organs. What do you see? Yeah, literally all of them. So so most places I go, the brain is the most prized. Uh, it always depends how it's cooked, right? The hunter gatherers tend to cook it very, very well. <laughs> they poach it over the fire. So it tastes like custard and like dessert. And uh, each, usually the, the next chief will, you know, kind of the up and coming boy will be consuming it and passing bites around to everyone. So it, it's still shared, but it's delectable. The glands are eaten pretty frequently. It, really the whole animal is eaten nose to tail. Uh, but the liver and kidney always, uh, some cultures don't eat the eyes, a couple, others prize them. So it has more to do with mythology with the okay. eyes and less to do with, with physical. Sometimes the, the food beliefs or the food traditions will come from uh, a very practical place for your health, where you can see with what we know from science now, why that's being done. But with the cultures that sometimes eat the eyes and not, it has more to do with mythology. I also see that, and it 
I, I want to preface this. We may find something uh, as we research more and learn more about the human body and how it interacts with nature and food. Uh, but at this stage, we don't have anything count, uh, really giving reason behind one of the things I've seen. And that is that a lot of the traditional cultures that are carnivore that I go to around the globe, it doesn't matter what their uh, environment is. It could be snow, it could be heat and around the equator. So that doesn't come into it, but they don't tend to eat chicken and eggs and fish if they're, uh, if they're herding carnivore. Now that doesn't apply for say the Inuit and all of the traditional cultures up north that certainly do eat fish and seal and, mm -hmm. and seafood as well. Uh, but there is, there is a pattern to that. Fascinating. I'm so intrigued. Um, there's so many places we could go with this. Mary, I do wanna ask you though, your handle on Instagram is Mary Queen of Hearts. And I've heard that you yourself have a deep relationship with heart as an organ meat. Is this related? Yes. And tell yes. me more about that. <laughs> yes. It was a little nod to my friend Brian, who's the liver king, long before. So I met him uh, before he became famous. He was wildly successful. And uh, I met him. He was seeing if I could take him to some, some tribal regions, basically. And so for our first trip, I did it as a little nod. <laughs> queen of heart because I love heart I love heart because I work with so many truly disabled people and so the mitochondria and the energy is is just not working and it's very difficult to repair tissue and cells to the level to get to remission without getting energy on the cellular level right and what heart is really good for is that it's really good for that it's not just the coenzyme q10 and some of the other factors you find in there it tends to really uh, uptick the energy for people so so I love it for that reason, but I also love it for the symbolic reason. And that is that we really don't feel through fighting something, right? The, the dialogue is so often, oh, that's a terrible diagnosis. You're going to fight this, you know, you're going to win. And as much as we would love to believe that fighting gets us to the results, those are unfortunately the people that tend to fall. And it's not an issue with them or their character. It's an issue with how we approach illness as a culture, right? Often with, with a chronic illness, uh, a serious illness or an immediate, it's a call for help from the body. The body's trying to communicate what you need. And it's really in softening and uh, being present and feeling what's going on rather than suppressing and then responding to that, that we tend to get better. And that happens through a lot of love. So I love the symbol of the heart. You know, you really have to fall in love truly with yourself to get better. It's Herculean, but it's yeah. very effective. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite ways to prepare heart in the many years that you've been oh. enjoying it? Yes. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I love it so much is because uh, you can consume it easily. It doesn't have the organ flavor that if you weren't raised on organ meats, you have difficulty with. Many people do anyway. And it, it's quite delicious. It's like a steak. So if someone is just starting out, I'll still often have it blended into ground beef or ground pork or ground chicken, whatever it is that they consume in about a 50-50 ratio or so, just to see if we can get it down. <laughs> Usually it's not a problem. Yeah. And then and then if someone likes it, like I do, like one of my favorite things that I used to make all the time when I was more stable in my own kitchen was this Moroccan meatloaf that I had adapted from one of Kat James' recipes. If you all don't know Kat James, she is a beauty expert who turned me on to how to make my own skincare and hair care and everything that was edible. She wrote a wonderful book back in 2007. So, so anyway, uh, so she had one of these recipes for Moroccan meatloaf. And I, I personally never liked meatloaf growing up, but for some reason I tried it and I mixed in heart. So good. That's one, <laughs> that's one of my favorites. I'm happy to share the recipe below. It's so good. And, and then I really like it Brazilian style. So mm -hmm. if it's, yeah. um, I tend to go for the larger animal organs. It's a personal preference. Uh, living in Greece, most people there like the small, so like the chicken hearts and things, but I tend to go for the big. So uh, so I like to cook it cubed, a bit like a steak, but I'll, I'll marinate it in typically Brazilian uh, herbs, like a chimichurri. Mm -hmm. And and then I'll, I'll cook it just lightly. I like my my steak and my meat pretty uh, medium rare. So, so that's another favorite way. Now in restaurants, especially if I'm traveling, 
most cultures around the globe do heart very well. So whether it's yakitori in Japan or uh, one of the Latin American countries like Peru, mm -hmm. it, it's really good barbecued on a stick. So I like it that way as well. But I would say it's the easiest because it is a muscle. So it tastes more like what we're used to. Absolutely. I completely agree. <laughs> All those sound divine. <laughs> yes. Um, so <laughs> Uh, so I actually heard, I think you mentioned on a different uh, podcast somewhere, maybe that you actually don't start people with liver, typically with mm -hmm. some of your clients that are, I don't know what I'm curious, like what situations you wouldn't start someone with liver. And then also like, I'm assuming that you would kind of guide them toward heart to start maybe like you said, with the energy benefits and how easy it is to, yeah. to consume and to enjoy really. Yes. So, but tell me I more about that, start... like where you start and kind of what you think about liver and not starting with that, or maybe if you do in some cases, like where, how you distinguish that. There's no question that liver is amazing, but it tends to give better health benefits when you're pretty healthy. It kind of takes mm -hmm. you to that next level. There's a lot of things that are like that, that are very good for us, but they're best at certain stages. It's something that a number of practitioners and I have noticed. And really, if you break down the detox channels in the liver, especially phase two, phase three, you can mm -hmm. see why that mm -hmm. would be the case. And, and we'll go into that. But, but I really like to start people on things that they'll enjoy because the reality is when, when we're ill, nothing is good. <laughs> nothing is fun. And, and you can't do all the fun things that you would normally do to bond with people and relieve your stress. And so it's very isolating. And the, the one form of entertainment can often come from food. So to lose that is, is a big loss, right? Because you don't have the mm -hmm. other things. I mean, look at how hard it is for people to diet just for weight loss, when they still mm -hmm. have all those other factors in place. When you're chronically ill, you don't even have those other factors. So it's it's very difficult journey to go on to. And so I like to make it as nice as possible, things that they'll actually like to eat and also will benefit them. So I'll often start with either heart or thymus. I love using thymus. It, the yeah. classic word is sweet bread. That's how it's mm -hmm. referred to at the nice restaurants. But that's an easy one because if the butcher does a good job of taking off the sheath, then you can make it into chicken nuggets, or all sorts of really good things. I mean, if you like thymus, which most people do, mm -hmm. uh, it's great by itself. You know, you can yeah. just uh, make it like scallops, but yes. So I'll, I'll yeah, since it's a white that. meat also, like it's very, people just wouldn't even consider it an organ meat if you served it. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they, they wouldn't even know. It's it's one of my favorite ways to get in uh, with children, I'll, especially if they can do dairy. I'll uh, have the mom cube it up or the dad into little nugget sizes and then mm -hmm. uh, dip it in the, the whipped egg. And then in uh, Parmesan is usually what we'll use to bread with, but maybe almond. It would just depend on what that person's health issues were. Yeah. And then fry it and they tend to really like it. So, Absolutely. Uh, so that's, yeah, I mean, I would eat it every day if someone was cooking for me. It's amazing. So, <laughs> or if I could get it, right? Yes. Only oh, young animals. Is. So yeah, it's yes, kind of tricky it's, sometimes. It's really hard to get. I, I didn't realize because I had such a great farm when I was living in Ohio. And although mm -hmm. I had to drive an hour once a week, it was a pleasure because the food and the dairy was so good. So when I moved to Oregon, there were wonderful butchers and, and I really mm -hmm. became close friends with my butcher as we often do in this world. Yeah. But they would order sweetbreads for me and it would only come in a 40 pound bucket, which you oh don't a 40 pound bucket. What are you going to do with all of that? <laughs> so, and it wouldn't be sheath. So now I understand it is, it is even more special than I realized. But one of the reasons why I don't typically start with liver unless I'm dealing with someone with say iron issues or something like that, is that the liver is under a lot of duress when we're trying to heal. And it should be, right? That's mm -hmm. its job. Its job is to clean. So it's not a problem. We don't have to go and do like massive detoxing. Uh, we can assist, you know, mm -hmm. what the body does, but, but the liver can do it. However, when we consume liver, it seems to slow that process down quite a bit. And a lot of practitioners and I have noticed that. So if an in, in an individual, they don't see that, there's no problem. Uh, so I wouldn't be worried about consuming it if, if someone's listening and they, they like it and they feel mm -hmm. good from it. Continue. <laughs> Definitely yeah. continue. Uh, because it's just pattern recognition. 
and the knowledge of what happens with the different pathways. There, there are certain times where there's a good time to bring things in, even things like starches, right? And things like that. So there are times and places where you can be very successful with that addition, or it can seem like a food you'll never be able to eat, which is never true, but, but it can seem that way. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to me a little bit more about these detox pathways, maybe explain mm -hmm the, you know, the different levels of breaking yeah. down the toxins and, um, and why, and how those could get compromised or why uh, liver might be. I'd, I'd love to. Okay. okay. So I, I have some background to, in this, but I think that it's important <laughs> so because bad. also people, you know, also so many people will say one of the first questions is, well, isn't liver a filter organ? You know, it must not be good to eat, but also because of the work of the liver breaking down toxins into component molecules, excreting them through the bile, right through this process of the phases. Um, yes. This is, in my opinion, yeah. definitely not true, right? If there were too many toxins, they would be shunted into the fat and stored yes. until the liver could process them. So it's not necessarily the case, but I think that there's just a general misunderstanding about the work of the liver in general. So if completely. you could share yes, some completely. insight into that. Yes, the toxins are not in the liver. So that's not why we will, we maybe not focus on it. Right. Uh, <laughs> completely different reasons. The Okay, so the liver breaks down are fat soluble toxins. Water soluble toxins go through the kidney. So let's go over some water soluble toxins. That would be some medications like ibuprofen. That would be some foodborne uh, plant toxins. That would be things like lectins and oxalates that goes through the kidneys. The fat soluble are much harder. Those water soluble we were just talking about go in and out of the body very quickly, mm -hmm. right? You sh they should. They right. should. <laughs> There's a caveat. Uh, the fat soluble go through the liver. So fats, bile, all of that goes through the liver. And bile is used really to remove a lot from the body. So right. uh, if you're dealing with chronic diarrhea with bile dumping, that's usually an indication that your body is actually trying to get rid of things and is successful at it and actually has the energy to do it. It, it has to be modified because bile can burn through the rectum and you can get you know, terrible tears and all sorts of things. But uh, it's a good sign because bile is a very labor intensive product for the body to produce. But because of that, even healthy individuals will rarely get rid of more than 5% of their, of their bile. They'll recycle it. And so, so when you're seeing a lot of dumping, that means that your body has the energy to actually make the bile get rid of it and make it again, which is a very good sign. But mm -hmm. that gets processed through the liver. So all fat soluble toxins go through the liver. Now let's go over some of those. Those are of course industrial. Uh, most of our, our uh, environment is pretty full of these from the, the plastics to, to uh, a lot of the man-made things that we've put together, perfumes, right? But mm -hmm. also our natural things that we would have in the body anyway. So that's our hormones, uh, that is our really all of our hormones. Don't just think estrogen and testosterone. <laughs> the hormones really go through there. Cortisol goes through there as well. So when we're stressed, we're, let's actually back up. When we're sick, we are stressed, right? If you have chronic mm -hmm. pain, it doesn't matter how much of a Buddha you are. Your, your body is under yeah. stress, right? And yeah. so you're producing a lot of cortisol. So that's already going to need to go through phase two, phase three to process these fat soluble toxins. Now mm -hmm. in that process, it's uh, backlogging all the other natural things that the body would be dumping. So that would be like your sex hormones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, your thyroid hormone, right? Thyroid is, is deeply connected to the liver. Yeah. And, so, and so everything can get deregulated from there. And if you've gained weight suddenly or have weight that you can't seem to lose, uh, or if it's perimenopause, weight or, or menopause weight, that's very common from having too much cortisol in the body. So if the cortisol is, is really clogging up those channels, the other, other hormones are a bit like the energizer bunny. Uh, they'll ping pong around and depending on where the, the receptors are, as they recirculate and recirculate, they can cause different symptoms and different problems. So, uh, so when the liver gets backed up, it'll create fat cells and the person will gain weight. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with calories. Right. right. And so, so it can be an issue of needing to get at that. Now, here's where we're in trouble with our modern diet, amongst other things. <laughs> when, when we are consuming a lot of foods that we've been told are very healthy, especially from the solanine family. So you're looking at the nightshades, the tomatoes, mm -hmm. the bell peppers, all of these, those 
fat soluble toxins, the solanines stay in the body for a very long time. We're talking 30 to 90 days, right? Mm -hmm. Where they can cause damage. But the problem in consuming them the way that we are now without the traditional processing techniques to mm -hmm. lower these, these aspects or seasonal they, recognition. Seasonal. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. They, the solanine can bind to the lectins and the water soluble toxins and keep them in the body for a very long time, as opposed to one day. So, so there's really a cascade there that can yeah. happen now, but the liver is very high vitamin, right? So when we're, we're talking right. about consuming liver, it's very high vitamin. There's an issue that anyone will see working with chronically ill people. And that is that when you do things that are very good for the human body, the chronically ill body freaks out. <laughs> it's basically what happens. And it, yeah, it makes ready. sense. Yeah, it's not ready. It makes sense because I, I think the best example is a fish tank. Most people have had a fish tank at some, at some point in their life. And most people also fall behind and don't always keep it the cleanest, right? So right. if you if you have a filthy fish tank and you come back from vacation and you're like, oh, I, I need to help, you know, my fish. So you get another fish tank that's in perfect conditions for the fish. You take the fish out of the dirty one, put them in the perfect one for them, not too clean. It's like perfect, right? They will all die. So So we can't go through these fast, like drastic changes like that the body really likes stasis and so this is because of the cortisol well like that you're talking about the cortisol yeah. relationship in the liver that it's actually yeah, just cortis Ooh. sorry, sorry finish your thought it's actually no no, no. i was i was just curious like i'm yeah like you were explaining this cortisol relationship and that that it can be fat soluble and so it needs to be broken down by the liver and if that it, it's I'm just thinking out loud because I really haven't understood this before or thought about it, that right. if that, like you're saying, if you're in, if you're in pain, you just do have cortisol all the time, right? Like you're just at a different right. level of on edge, you know, it's just a chronic condition, right? So I'm just yes. perceiving that it's because of, I, I, I guess you explained it because it is one component, but if. Yeah, it's on, one sorry component, but it's also because we're not living in, uh, in a way for our nervous system or for our sex hormones. So our hormonal system is very intricate and it's amazing. <laughs> it's my favorite to study. It, we tend to think of it as so black and white, like estrogen this, just no, it is not. Uh, it's not just affected by diet. It is very affected by our interactions with each other. In fact, I can utterly change someone's testosterone levels simply by changing how they interact with women in their life. So, mm -hmm. so the hormones are really responsive to that. And what's happened since the 1970s, really with the change of gender roles is that we're not living for our, our hormones, right? We're, we kind of have this idea that we can be very independent and it's naive. It's very mm -hmm. naive. We're a communal species. Mm -hmm. And so as we've gotten more isolated, each of us, right? In our homes, in our, in our rooms and all of that, which is very understandable uh, honestly, it's, it's a, I think a natural reaction to all the sounds, the lights and the stimulation. So I, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's a healthy coping mechanism, but the problem is that as we've both, uh, kind of both sexes have decided we can do everything right. <laughs> uh, the, the males can do lots of things that were traditional female, uh, feminine and vice versa. Our hormones are in a tizzy. And so we're seeing it just vast cases of horrific perimenopause and menopause, which was not seen before. You know, we often think that these things that we're dealing with have always been the case, but they're not, uh, even very recently, even just for my mom's generation. So, right. so it's really an uptick. And part of that is because most of us uh, are living, most of us females are living very masculine and that does produce the masculine hormones. Now, there's probably a way to work that with our modern society. I'm sure there's there's a way to finesse that. But right now, because people aren't aware of it, they aren't aware of do to balance that. And so the hormones are already very off whack before you add in all the carbohydrates, all the estrogenic foods uh, and everything else. And then, of course, our clothing, because most of our clothing is plastic. And that affects our hormones as well. It's, it's estrogenic. So, so all of that comes in and, and really bogs down the liver. But I, I think the cortisol is, is a large problem. One, because it's something we really need. 
right? If you're someone who wakes up and has a difficult time getting moving, you're not producing cortisol at the right time. That's when we should be producing cortisol, serotonin, dopamine to pop us awake, right? right. So cortisol is not an enemy. It's that it's been mishandled. And so it's kind of running about with no rules in the body. It doesn't want that either, but that is the case of it. And as that happens, and as we're producing the wrong hormones for our own body, that gives the liver extra burden at a time in history when it has never been so burdened by right. industrial chemicals. So you couple all that together and really anything that can help the liver is going to be a good idea. <laughs> right. Yes. So I know that refined carbohydrates, things like that can kind of turn the bile into something that resembles more like molasses than like Dawn dish soap, right? To kind of move through the body and to get into the small intestines and do its work. But um, how, how, what do you do in your practice or what do you recommend for people that have sluggish bile or that are constipated or that want to move into this kind of next level of clearing like liver detox and things like that? I'm sure that there are many components that you use in your... Yeah program, but just at a high level, if you could share. Yeah, at a high level, we often think that the gallbladder is just something we can take out and many of right. listeners probably have it removed. <laughs> yes. yes. It's not important. <laughs> yes. And, and also that if we take it out, then we need to eat low carb or we need to not eat high fats, that, right? Exactly. Yes. And that's not the way it works. So if I get someone and they're in a crisis with their gallbladder, when they first come to me, Immediately, I'm going to work on a couple of things. Usually the gallbladder in crisis has deficiencies. It's usually taurine, which is an amino mm -hmm. acid or mm -hmm. vitamin C. So we mm -hmm. kick that up. Uh, if there's stones, that's typically parasites, right? When you cut open a gallbladder stone, there's a fragment of a parasite in there. It's the body's natural way to get rid of them. So that's, mm -hmm. that's always part of it. But oftentimes it's not a stone issue. It's really an issue with not making bile. So where does that come from? Because it's not just from deficiency right? Uh, it's really coming from this whole era that we were born and raised in of avoidance of fats and, and cholesterol. Yeah. The gallbladder, yeah. The gallbladder is like a muscle, right? So if you were an athlete growing up and you stopped lifting for the last 15 years and your arms have become like spaghetti, if you went and did your, your workout from high school, you would be humbled. <laughs> you would be in a lot of pain, right? right. And you probably wouldn't be able to lift your arm for a week or more. So, so it's very similar. The gallbladder works like that too. So when it hasn't been used for a lifetime or for a long time, it's de it's deconditioned quite literally it's deconditioned. And so the reason why people have correlated, Oh, I ate this high fat meal. And, and then I had my gallbladder attack. It's because they hadn't been eating fat. And then they mm -hmm. suddenly consume a lot with carbohydrates. So that would be like your French fries, right? right. Or your hamburger with bun. Yeah. Those foods should never be a problem for the human body. It's an issue of that not being, uh, a, you, it's not used to that level of fat. And so when I get someone, uh, let's say who just had their gallbladder removed before I meet them, which happens a lot right? Yeah. Uh, in that case, we want to get the liver producing the bile. The liver will start producing it in lieu of the gallbladder. And for that, you actually inform it. Much of the body is about informing. Same with our hormones. It's very mm -hmm. much about being conscientious and informing. So uh, rather than staying on a, a, low, a low fat diet, <laughs> which is what has been taught, really you slowly and, and with regimen uh, increase the fat. So let's say you increase by half a teaspoon today, mm -hmm. uh, next week, then you'd go to a full teaspoon mm -hmm. and then a teaspoon and a half every week, but you go very, very slow. And what that does is that informs the body. Oh, she wants me to break down this fat. She is eating fat right. now instead of that shock of, you know, 12 tablespoons right. of fat on the system. Yes. <laughs> and so, uh, do you also supplement at the same time, bile salts, things like that? to support sometimes uh, it depends on the person so yeah if i've got someone that's facing gallbladder attack i'll usually work on those deficiencies and that works like a charm yeah but if i have someone chronic who who's dumping bile and things like that then we may do uh, uh anything from like uh tmg to bile to yeah bile salts or uh honestly a bunch of things soluble yeah. fiber as well which is found in like artichokes and onions and mm -hmm. garlic uh, things like that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I love nerding out with this stuff with you. 
Um, I have a couple other questions. I'm curious if where you find contraindications. So we talked about some contraindications with liver, right? Like that yes. in this kind of chronic condition, you wouldn't start with that necessarily. Um, and also addressing the issues of the bile and the gallbladder and the detox pathways. But um, are there other organ meats that you see contraindications for? Or are there other contraindications with liver as well? Like certainly with true gout, as opposed to like pseudo gout based on oxalates or something um, that can purines. I haven't even seen it be an issue with true gout mm -hmm. because true gout, uh, but take that with a grain of salt because that could just be the people that I've seen. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. yeah, so it could be an issue for people out there. Um, but uh, let me think for a minute if there's anything I wouldn't do. Well, a lot of the organs are high histamine. So oh, if right. someone, so I did want to ask yes. you about that. Let's talk yes. about that. Yes. Yeah. So if someone's histamines are very high, it wouldn't be an appropriate time. We might be able to use something like kidney if they have a DAO issue. So an issue with the enzyme that breaks down histamines. But for many people, uh, that's not the issue. And so they're not going to get benefit from the kidney. You have to test it out in each person. But most of the organs are pretty high histamine. And histamine is not a bad thing. It does a lot of wonderful things in the body. We can't heal a cell without it. We don't have a clear thinking brain without it, right? A lot of the, the quote unquote smart drugs that traders will use and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of off the books <laughs> they'll use, right. those work by increasing histamines in the brain because histamines make you very alert. That's why people with histamine intolerance have so much insomnia. Right now, they're going to they're going to listen and say, I am not alert. I feel really tired all the time. But that's because it's a full intolerance. So there's a lot more going on than just a, a full bucket of histamines. But yeah, so histamines can be really good and they're they're incredibly needed. But uh, what we're seeing is is really vast histamine issues. So when I first started practice well over a decade ago, uh, I was the only person uh, that I knew of professionally working specifically with histamine intolerance because it was rare. It wasn't mm. common. <laughs> and now it's mm. exceedingly common, right? It's really exceedingly, unfortunately common. And it's a very tricky thing uh, to have as a person because nothing is consistent. And so, you know, you kind of pull your hair out going crazy, trying to figure out what you can eat. But the uh, the organ meats are naturally high histamine. Most of the, the most healthy things are high histamine. So what I do in those cases is I work on lowering the histamine bucket. And mm -hmm. then as we can bring those things in, we do. I never work with histamine issues as a, okay, this is what you're going to have for the rest of your life. And so let's do just like a, you know, a moderate, a moderate protocol. I, I don't do those. Some people do teach that. For me, having been sick, I think there's no greater freedom than food choice and, and the ability to choose what you eat because it makes you feel good, not because you have to. Yeah. And so I always work on really lowering that histamine load and then shifting that microbiome and, and getting all of that working again so How that they don't end the up with these histamine issues. How is this? I really yeah, appreciate your explanation question. of like kind of the water soluble and fat soluble toxins. And I'm kind of just curious yeah. from your experience or impression how how we're ending why this is growing and like how why you see it so often and what you think the genesis I think we're is. seeing it for a few different reasons one you know there's three different forms of histamine issues there's the the very epigenetic the MCAD and that form you usually know if you have it from childhood because it mm -hmm. comes with a lot of anaphylaxis mm -hmm. uh, a lot of rashes too kind of the more typical symptoms that you would read on a google search right. Right. Yeah. And then you have the one that I see the most, which is from bacterial dysbiosis. That's just okay. widespread. Right. And when we start to get, get, getting the microbiome back in order. Very much so. Yeah. Because that actually works for both of those. Right. When you have an epigenetic condition, if you get your bacteria in the order, the yeah. genes can turn off and that's your best shot at it. Yeah. So, so I always work at that. Somebody that has some of these histamine issues in your practice, for example, are you recommending any organ meats at all? Or as a class, are you kind of avoiding them for that? I definitely do later, but not in the beginning. It's right. very rare for me to use organ meats at the beginning, aside from very specific conditions. Like okay. if I have someone uh, with the stage four cancer, mm -hmm. we'll do uh, thymus, a lot of thymus. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, or someone with bone cancer will do the bone marrow. So, so yeah. there's specific conditions where we really hit it heavy, but usually uh, not in the beginning because the... Uh, the, the organ meats are 
very healing. So meaning that when the body gets it, it's going to get excited and start to regenerate cells quickly. And that's not always what we want in the beginning, because we need, we need someone to run the marathon of getting yeah. better. And that can, that can be a very uncomfortable process when they're mm-hmm. already uncomfortable. So I'll usually get past that initial one to three months first mm-hmm. and then start bringing them in, but it, it's quite individual. Maybe they also trust you more after a few months and then you can say, do this weird thing. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Trust has to be earned. So, and I am aware of that. So I do stage things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let me transition with a question that's still kind of technical that leads us into like this discussion. I really want to dive into about your experience with traditional mm-hmm. cultures. And this is a question that I have. I have read uh, in kind of the foundational works of Western Price in his materials and even in the kind of deep on in the foundation that he did not really find um, communities that had more than 20% protein in their diet. That mm. I don't, and I'm just curious, like I, I feel like I've, I've read this, I've seen this, that they were tended to be, none of the diets were high protein, even though some mm. of them were entirely animal-based. And now I think that many people recognize that they feel better on a high protein diet. They, you know, and, and it's very popular, right? It's in our modern yes. culture. I'm just kind of curious in your experience, um, in your personal experience, and also what you've seen in traditional cultures with respect to protein, or if you actually are not measuring it so specifically or observing, like, or the way you observe it because it's, it's all animal foods, but just the fat to protein ratios. I'm, I'm very curious question. about this. Yeah, that's a great question. No one's asked me that before. And it's an important one, actually. Uh, I, I haven't seen as low, like 20%. That isn't too common. Uh, but I don't see high protein. I don't. I think we're going to... How would you define high protein then? I would, I would define it as like more than... Uh, so for me, I weigh 126, let's say, around mm-hmm. there. And if I were to consume over say a hundred grams of protein, that would be very high, right? That's a mm-hmm. hundred grams in American, right? Yeah. So usually with my clients, we do more of the 20%. We do more of like the uh, 60 grams or so per day. It's individual though. It depends on the condition. There are people that definitely feel better on high protein. I, I think it's really easy, especially as you start to get into the traditional diets and your fat goes up to kind of forget about protein, especially women. I see this pattern quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So it, not that they don't eat it, they do, but they're not getting much, maybe like 40 grams a day. And I would say that's too low when we're under really under 55 grams a day, kind of within the range of height of adult humans. It's difficult to make all your feel good chemicals. We need our amino acids to do a number of things for us. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a real benefit in a a bit higher protein right now, uh, especially for women. So I notice when I get someone who maybe their hair is breaking off and their skin doesn't look good and, and that kind of thing, but otherwise they're healthy. If they increase their protein, it usually just takes care of it. Yeah. Right. So, so a bit of increase is good, but I think the CrossFit trend of the extreme protein is problematic, especially for the women, but is in general. And part of that comes down to the fact that we are very compromised from our external environment and and all the onslaughts. So most of us are not converting excess protein into sugar. Uh, the way traditional societies would have done or a Mm. very healthy individual would do. And so you get kind of a, uh, you get stuck in this in-between energy zone if you're not eating enough carbs and you don't have enough fat and you have the high protein. So that Mm -hmm. can be a problem. Absolutely. I haven't seen protein be attacks on anything like the kidneys, nothing like that. So I haven't seen those issues where I've seen the issues is if someone isn't mindful of their energy system. Right. Because we humans were complex. We're very lucky. Most animals don't have a choice of what energy system they use. Mm -hmm. We do. We have ketosis. We have, we can use glucose. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more Uh, from what I've seen. I, I really do think there's a third one, but we have that choice right now. And so what I find is a lot of folks, when they start to tweak their diet, they get stuck in this in between zone. They're, if we test their blood, they're not actually in ketosis, even if they're on carnivore. Uh, they could be not eating carbs, but eating a lot of protein. And right. so it's, it's them from it. Or 
uh, or they're eating uh, so much protein that they're not getting into ketosis. So, so you can end up in this in-between zone where you don't have energy from glucose and you don't have energy from fat. And that's yeah. where you get that burnout at like the six month mark. So, so I do see people consume too much protein. I have not seen it be a tax on organs at all. Yeah. Also, um, I've read that there's could be some research saying that it would affect the mTOR pathways and, you know, decrease longevity, but you've been yeah. around the world. You've seen people eating. Um, no, I don't see it at all. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, at all. And the, the protein levels vary by season as well and what's around. But in general, the fat level is so high that that does keep the protein uh, usually around 30%. So mm -hmm. between the 20 and 30%, uh, but it's not something that they're mindful of. They're just consuming. Right. They're just eating the food that's available. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to me about the organ meats and uh, the preference, like the preference for organ meats. And if muscle meats, Western price said that in some cases, like the far North Indians, that they would give the muscle meat to the dogs. Right. Mm -hmm. But those animals wouldn't get any organ meats. And also like how often are they hunting or having access to a full animal, right? Because the organ meats won't last. They don't keep. I'm kind yes. of curious oh, but with your... Yeah, none of these cultures keep food. So okay. uh, so there's certainly like the traditional cultures of Europe and Russia and these places that were more subsidy farmers that would keep right. food. Uh, but the places I go, they're either hunter-gatherers or they're agrarian and they don't keep food. Uh, they have so okay. much abundance. Yeah, they're not hungry. Yeah. They're not worried about food tomorrow. Okay. So they always catch full animals if they're hunter-gatherer. The size depends on where they are, but they do have access to fatty things. So like when I'm in the Amazon, there's usually fish as well mm -hmm. as the things that they'll hunt. They tend to go after uh, a lot of the the ape species they really like. So uh, all over the world, if I'm around those. So, wow. so they'll really go for that. And that's very fatty. Uh, they go okay. for the brain and the fatty bits and things like mm -hmm. that. Many of the hunter gatherer groups that I've gone to really don't feed their animals. They don't give scraps. In right. fact, they get really angry when right. the dogs <laughs> go for it, but the dogs hunt themselves. So oh, they get I their see. own things. Yeah, is typically how it is. And they'll certainly sneak in and get things, but they do get reprimanded. Now, yeah. in in places like when I'm with dog sled teams up with the Inuit up in the Arctic, that's a little different. They do feed those dogs, but it is as an afterthought. It's whatever they're not having. Uh -huh. uh, and they do eat the whole animal. So they'll they'll typically go for the organs first. The liver is almost almost always consumed raw in the places that I go to. Mm -hmm. So the liver and the kidney are typically consumed raw and first and immediate. Uh, and and how, then, and so they'll, they'll slice it and like uh, share it with the whole community. I imagine yes. like it would be broken up into pieces and then the same with the kidney, it would be broken up into small pieces. And That's is it exactly. more like a carpaccio? Is it more like pieces? How are they yeah, consuming this? Yeah, it's small. It would be like a, a nickel to a quarter size piece okay. and it's casual. So whoever yeah. is around the kill, let's say a seal was just pulled up, yeah. maybe 12 people come down and they're all excited. And someone will bid for certain organs and things, and then they'll take those away. And while they're doing that, someone is is cutting open the belly, cleaning the animal. And then when it's time, they take the liver out and they just cut it casually. And as someone finishes a bite, they get another one. Right. So it's a very casual uh, way of consuming, but that's how I see all the organ meats eaten, really. Mm -hmm. And yeah. do you find that, um, that these cultures are concerned about parasites or have any relationship with them or do certain parasite cleanses with the raw things that they're consuming? Like right in our culture, it's like we're taught, you know, USDA food safety guidelines say to freeze for seven days at negative four degrees or for, you know, 17 hours at negative 31 degree, right? Like we have all these guidelines. And so Sally Fallon, nourishing traditions, freeze everything for two weeks as a safety parameter, right? Um, yes. Yeah. No, I'm just curious. No, they, they don't get sick. So they don't typically have, unless I've gone to a semi-modern. And when I say semi, I mean, they brought in like two things from modernity. So not a lot, yeah. but unless I go to something like that, or I'm in a region where there was mining, so heavy metal dumping around them, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no issue with parasites. So much so that when I was with uh, the, uh, the Batwa in Uganda, who lived in the trees, right? Hunter-gatherers who lived in the trees just until 30 years ago. They were pushed out of the forest to protect the gorillas, which was silly because they protect the gorillas, but it was a political move. 
uh, uh, these countries really don't want the indigenous. So, so they're pushed out. They're not allowed to eat their traditional diet. So now they're like subsidy farmer, like with corn, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're used to eating meat two to three times a day. Anyway, uh, this new generation, just from the last four years, is the first one to get the parasite bellies, and they've never seen it before, mm. right? They're drinking the exact same water they were drinking before. They're literally on the edge of the forest. <laughs> they were right. right inside it. So same water source. It's when the microbiome, at least in, from what I've seen, it's very much uh, how healthy your microbiome is if you get yeah. sick. Yeah, it's very much uh, the issue with... Uh, so they don't have special herbs that they... Use for these. No. So I read also somewhere, maybe Fred Provenza, the Maasai have like 30 different um, herbs that they use for different things, but that they mix into meat or, or mix into milk or something yeah. like that for medicinal I, properties or. I have literally see never seen that okay. <laughs> in all of my places that, and I go to a lot of them and I go to them frequently. Yeah. That said, that doesn't mean that there aren't some that do. There are changes between villages and Absolutely. especially as you get more modern and, and now you know, Tanzania, uh, where a lot of the Maasai are, there's also Maasai in Kenya, of course, but uh, in both countries, part of why the Maasai have been able to do so well is because one, they're very proud of their culture. And yeah. two, the governments love the tourism dollars that come in uh, to come and, mm -hmm. and visit them for an hour or so. So some yeah. of the villages uh, don't obviously have tourists, but some do. And the ones that do tend to have more of that. The only time I ever saw herbs was more than one was in Kenya that very close to kind of where you, you know, out in the Serengeti where you do the hot air balloons and things. And they were traditional Maasai. They, they lived in the huts, they drank the blood and the milk, but they had cell phones and things, you know, so they, they had uh, uh, a lot of touch from, from other cultures. And one of the ladies was selling an herbal drink, but it was very much for sale. <laughs> And oh, it's not something I've seen anywhere else. Yeah. Now, that said, uh, all of the, the Maasai villages that I go to, definitely in Tanzania, there is one very specific herb that they they add to their organ uh, organ meat broth. And it's very, very bitter. And uh, but it's it's only one. They don't use other things. So in general, the herb use is very little because when you're in good health, there's not much need now. Yeah. There's a couple exceptions. I know that the San in South Africa and Botswana, incredible herbal knowledge. And in much of mid, uh, Latin America and South America, there's so many poisonous, deadly snakes. Mm -hmm. And their herbal knowledge of what to do is brilliant. Um, yeah. They can save your leg and your life very quickly. Whereas if you go to the hospital, you could lose both. So, right. so they really know what to use in those situations. But I, I've been really surprised by how little herbal use I've seen. I see it much more once a culture is living in larger communities and uh, more more in line with modernity, I would say. Then, then we start to see a lot of herb usage. Yeah. So I heard you say an organ meat broth. Talk to me about organ meat broth, organ meat soup, um, which sure. cuts would go into that, how, they would, how you've seen them prepared in different places. Sure. Yeah. So with the Maasai, when they kill an animal, they'll drink the blood first and then have some of the raw organs and then cook. Do they, some th there's a lot of blood in an animal. Some yes. of it is wasted. Some they preserve it. Some oh, no. Or, no, it's just they. there's enough people that it's all consumed. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, it's all consumed, actually. So, uh, wow. yeah, I know. I know. But it's really delicious and it really yeah. gives you of energy and it's very satiating as well you don't feel like you need a meal you feel like you've had one it's really a living organ it's it's really powerful stuff you know i read a book mary um about this well my husband read it actually but he saved this part for me willie sutton he was a bank robber at the turn of the century and he worked in a meat packing plant in the united states and they basically for lunch like all the men just had a cup that was strapped to their belt and they would just go down to the floor and take the blood off the floor from the processing plant and they would drink that. And that was what they sustained themselves on when they worked these 12, 14 hour days in this processing plant, the turn of the century. Wow. wow. So not so foreign that's even right. to us. That's but, mind blowing. Right? Yes. I love yes. that. Like just that it's not so far away as we think. It's not so foreign. You don't have to be some indigenous tribal person from Africa to be drinking blood. Like actually. Yes. Not at all. In fact, a lot of the places that I go to that, uh, especially as I get closer to the cities, they're hybrid. So I may have a social contact in one of the cities, 
you know, and if, if they take me out to some of the like middle range regions mm -hmm. and an animal is slaughtered, they will go from driving a Rolls Royce to drinking blood from yeah. an animal. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's just normal, right. but we're, we're more divorced from that, especially in America, you know, the, the other countries, uh, blood sausage is very normal. Right. And blood is incorporated. Yes. Yes. Here you can't even more... really get it. I mean, processors don't have the HACCP, you know, the hazard analysis plan to even keep it. And yes, it, I mean, also yeah. it would curdle, right. So it has to be fresh in some sense, like on-farm slaughters and stuff, but it's so foreign people, even people that do on-farm slaughters, they're unfamiliar with it. They're nervous about it. They don't want to touch it. They certainly wouldn't want to drink it. Yes. Right. It's it's yeah, very interesting. How can that shift over time? I, yes. I well, or I don't I don't know. Maybe it's not for everybody. But <laughs> no, I think a lot of it came from our obsession with sterilization yeah. and with packaging in the states. You know, we we really more than any other country are very divorced from where our food comes yeah. from and and what's natural. So we're like horrified at the, the right. thought of blood. I mean, even when you were telling me that story and I love when I get to have blood because I feel superhuman, but the, like, I, I really do. If I was sick again, I would, I would want access to that daily. But the, uh, the story about the <laughs> being, being in the, uh, the place and drinking the blood, that still sounds like, oh, I don't know, because it's so many animals, right? But those right. were probably the healthiest people who were having that. Right. So yes, so- Yeah, like so really, our, really strong men, right? Like that these guys were doing like the hardest work and were really, like you said, superhuman. Yes, from, exactly. From drinking this and, and really su yeah. su was sustaining themselves on it because it, was a, it wasn't a one-time thing. It was actually what they did whenever they were hungry or when they had a break or, yes. right? For weeks, yes. months on end. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Yes. So, so no, I think it's really amazing. Uh, you asked about the organs about and the broths. soups. Yeah, mm -hmm. and soups. <clears throat> yes. So if we just take the Maasai, uh, and this is something I see throughout, I see this in Mongolia too, and in other carnivore cultures as well, they'll take the other organs that they don't eat raw. So basically everything that's not the liver and the kidney, and they'll also take the bowel, which the colon is stuffed with like grass and things like that. And they'll make a tea out of that. Uh, they call it a tea, but it's really, it's a broth. Right. And so it simmers and boils for a long time. And this is what they put that very bitter herb in, uh, which I do think addresses so they parasites. Cleanse out, yeah. They cleanse out like this, the colon and those other to be parts, or are they, are you using the fermented grass that's inside yeah, you, of the organ of the animal? Yeah, they keep <laughs> they the are. fermented grass. They do. Now, those organs are not actually consumed. They're boiled and then you have the broth. So, so they're discarded. Um, and the grass, but, that's also, would it be like go through a sieve kind of thing? Like, would that also be preserved or, okay. So they're just drinking yeah. effectively the juice yes. of that. Yeah. Part. Okay. That's exactly it. Yes. Okay. It is very, very bitter uh, because of the herb that they put in. You did ask mm -hmm. about herbs and parasites and that did jostle my memory about something. It's not uncommon for me to see an antiparasitic item not used as medicine, but as a, a daily or weekly food. Mm. So for instance, with the Maasai, that herb, yeah. it's very bitter and it has yellow. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's an antiparasitic. It, it looks like one from the other. It's very similar to the others. Mm. With say the Chaga who live on mm -hmm. Mount Kilimanjaro, they have banana beer once a week on Sundays, the whole village, the children too. And this is really a ferment. It's really not a beer. It's, it's almost chewy. It's thick, yeah. but they use the bark of the, the fever tree, which is an anti-malarial and that's used in the ferment. And so whether they know it or not, once a week, they're getting an antiparasitic. And that, that happens to be the exact cycle of most egg spans for parasites. So it would prevent anything from growing, but in general, these folks are just very, very healthy, really. Yeah. So Yes, they don't have the problems we do or the vulnerabilities. What about in Mongolia? You said organ meat soup there. I think I heard you mention yeah, same that in another talk. Yeah, same thing. And there the head is typically cooked just as long. So the brain is a bit rubbery, but the whole thing is consumed. So when you eat there, uh, everything is served on a plate and it, it'll kind of just be all chopped up and, and piled on. So, you know, you'll have the liver here and the head here and, and all of this and you kind of dig in. And, and you start eating, uh, but, and then the but broth yeah. is separate that, and it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not like a soup where it has pieces of things in it. The meats are all stacked. You're eating them. And then Perfect. the broth is just consumed as a beverage. 
That's correct. Okay. Now, other regions that I go to, the broth is really a soup. So a lot of places mm. on the Amazon having, say, piranha soup is very common. Or places in Africa, they call it banana soup. It's really plantain uh, with a lot of meat or fish. So it's a meat or fish broth. And then some plantain in there, the way we would use potato and, mm -hmm. and other things as well. So there's lots of traditional soups in many of the places I go. But the carnivore groups do tend to separate it for some reason. And do they do any uh, salt or seasonings or really everything is just the salt is in the meat and that's... Yes. Yeah. So it depends uh, on the culture. The cultures that are drinking blood get their sodium from the blood. Yeah. Uh, so they don't, they don't need an additional salt, but they do like it. And sometimes they'll use it. It's more the cooking cultures that tend to do it. Okay. You know, a lot of cultures that are very centric around uh, animal consumption, especially if it's in a heat region, a very hot, sunny region, they cook things very quickly. And so they're not doing all this, uh, these culinary prowesses that we tend to mm -hmm. do, right? And it's very quick over the fire and then you eat. Uh, but they do love salt. So that is typically one of the things that I, I always bring as a gift is a lot of salt. Some places harness their own and others will do um, like an herb in it. So because you asked about herbs in yeah. a lot of, a lot of uh, the Arctic, definitely in Greenland, but I, I did see it just on my last trip up in, in Norway and Sweden and Finland. Uh, there's a, an herb that's used within the salt as well. It's picked in the, in the summer and then it's added there and it's a nice flavor, but it has medicinal properties too. So salt is a thing. It's a common thing. Okay. And what about vitamin C in the animal-based cultures? Of course, the adrenal glands, um, Western price yeah. of the second stomach, the honeycomb yeah. tribe, and that they have this wisdom. They know they eat those foods raw. Yeah. Or yeah, they I do, think. and they don't. They don't have any of the uh, the symptoms of vitamin C deficiency. So you know, I I really I don't know where your audience is in terms of of. Uh, education or trial and error on themselves. But in general, there's certain diets that require a lot more vitamins than others. And yeah. the diet that we've been on for the last 30 years or so requires the most. But when you transition to these traditional diets in the myriad of ways that they present, uh, you don't get the same deficiencies or mm -hmm. significant deficiencies. So yeah, I haven't had any anyone with deficiency. They're not going around looking for lemons or mm -hmm. making hibiscus tea. None of those kinds pine of needles. things. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I know that cultures did. And I, I like to drink pine needle tea. It's a great way to get vitamin C. I use mm -hmm. it with my clients, but uh, but no, they don't they don't have the same need. Now, there are some bacteria that technically we should be getting from our mothers that do produce vitamin C, just like they do for mm. other animals. And we are we've been lacking those for a couple generations. So so that could be part of it as well. Yeah. They may just still have that. Uh, but no, they get it from the animal product and, and they're not consuming things that, that cause a deficiency. So, wow. So it seems to me, um, just from what I've read over the years and also what you're sharing that all the time, all the places that these are consumed in traditional cultures, it's very simple. Like they're really just eating the meat as it presents and there is no fanfare around it, right? We're so squeamish. I feel like it requires so much celebration and like work and do something to hide it or to, you know prepare it in some special way that we could actually consider or stomach. But yes. you're telling me that all these cultures, they just are eating these like any cut of meat, like any other part of the animal. And, um, and that all yeah. of it is consumed. When you say glands as well, like I've noticed um, from processing animals that like, there's just like so many little glands that will be in like the fat around different parts, like maybe in the gels, like the, I don't know if they're lymph glands or like all these little mm -hmm. things, presumably all that is it. Have you noticed that cuts like that might be prized or um, or they're just regular meats? They're actually not anything special. I don't even know what all these little glands are, but you see them like little nodules, like in different parts of animals when you're breaking them down. Yeah, they're prized. They are prized. Okay. And then each culture kind of has their own favorite bit. So a lot of places, if there's lamb, they usually like the lamb fat on, mm -hmm. around the tail. Like yes, that is a fat. favorite. Yeah, that's a favorite yeah. thing. But yeah, the, the glands are, are uh, adored right? They're consumed very quickly. So, so yes, those are, those are definitely a favorite thing. And how often is an animal being uh, like slaughtered or consumed? I guess it depends on the size of the community, as long as it takes for them to go through it. And then another, it actually it depends weekly, or it depends more on their traditional diet. So okay. cultures that do the blood, milk, and meat, they're going to slaughter one to two times a week. 
So two times if it's more like goat sized uh -huh. and uh, once if it's a cattle, Cow -sized, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so at least three days of the week, they're doing blood and milk. So mm -hmm. you're getting, yeah, that. And then other cultures that are more hunter gather, uh, I mean, they're slaughtering daily and wow. uh, yeah, cultures that live uh, kind of herding, but not as much on blood and milk. They, especially in, in certain seasons daily. So, so it really depends on the culture and what their traditional diet is. And then others, you know, you were, you were saying about the preparation. There are some that go through extensive preparation with fermentation, like the Inuits. Mm. I mean, they, uh, it's probably not very complicated to anyone who's fermented. You know, they do these things very quickly, but they ferment a lot of their meats and things under the snow. And that can go for a year of fermentation that's then used at a celebration. What they don't have is this idea of color and variety. So they don't right. have, yeah, there's no bright colors or a rainbow on any of these plates. And there's also not variety. You might get seasonal variety if you're lucky, but you have the same meal for each meal every day for a season. That's very, very typical. I was actually wondering about that. I was, that was a question that I had just in the back of my mind, not that I was going to ask, but about different times of day. Like if there's something that they start their day with, or if it's always the same foods, um, you know, in every meal. Yeah, it's pretty. You're it's saying that it pretty, pretty much typically is the, same the same foods. foods. Most don't do breakfast. Most mm -hmm. are like two two meals, one or two meals a day, but it, it does vary. Some are three. Mm -hmm. uh, the cultures around Ethiopia tend to do coffee in the morning. They have coffee ceremonies amongst all mm -hmm. the different communities and tribes. But uh, but in general, breakfast is not a thing. You usually go about your day a bit, and then you and then you eat. It's usually how it's done. Is that because it takes time to prepare the food? Like if all the food is coming from scratch, I mean, like the, are there people in the community, presumably women that are starting to work on that first thing in the morning, they're getting the water, they're doing things that might be required to prepare food or to have it available. Kind or... of. Uh, most of the cultures do have uh, foods that you eat quickly oh, okay. uh, that don't take much work. And then okay. if you're looking at cultures that like do the coffee ceremony, that takes two hours every morning okay. <laughs> that all the ladies do. Yes. So that's extensive. Wow. But in general, it, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they're very satisfied and not hungry. They're very mm -hmm. stable. They don't really need to eat. When they right. sit down to eat, they're not jonesing for it. They, they're not hankering, yeah. you know, or irritable. So, so it's, it fits more in line with the day and they tend to go outside more in the morning to do things rather than, uh, you know, kind of sitting down and relaxing. So I'm under the impression now that like 44% of a cow in a processor in the United States is actually going to a landfill. Typically. That's insane. I'm it's sorry. insane. <laughs> I know. Or like over 30% of a pig. Wow. And um, I, I think that as an American, that I'm not even familiar with all of the parts of the animal that we're losing, right? Like yeah. I get my own, I got my own half cow. I've gotten my own pig, but this is like a kill and chill, right? The processor does this. I have to fight to get the organs. Um, and I don't even know what else could be in there. Certainly there's a a lot of weight associated with, um, well, I recently actually got like a full stomach of a cow, right? Like all four stomach chambers. And, uh, I mean, that had to have been like 30 or 35 pounds and then, but left the intestines and the colon and, um, all, of, so I'm, I'm really curious. And also the farmer was like, well, yeah, you can take, I mean, I took it all. <laughs> I kind of wanted it break it down myself and clean it out myself and everything. Plus I, I think that all these uh, different cuts of tripe are really valuable in their own ways. So I wanted access to them. I cleaned them, but I'm just, so I hear you saying with like the intestines, maybe in some cases those are going into a soup with the grass that those mm -hmm. would be, would make this juice or broth with the bitter herb. Tripe I'm assuming could probably be cleaned and just consumed as a neat. I don't, maybe yeah. long cooked or it's typically ever raw or. Skewered. I haven't seen it raw, Grilled. but it, it, it could just be that I've missed it. It's usually mm -hmm. grilled is usually how okay. I see it. It's also made into soup in some cultures, but grilled is the most common. That for I all meats in yeah. these cultures? Uh, no, no, no. For tripe. Just for yeah, tripe. For the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For the tripe. And the, you know, the things in that we're not strips eating? strips and pieces? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. yeah okay. It's like a, you take a long, the, you, you can find this on any street in most parts of Europe. It's still okay. a common food here, but it's long strips that are then uh, a stick goes kind of zigzag mm -hmm. with the meat. So the meat yep. goes on the stick and then you grill or you put it over a fire. That's a very common way of consuming it. The, 
the thing that I don't see people eating that is eaten everywhere else and really like sought after would be the bits that probably seem a bit strange to us, but have an enormous amount of collagen and soft tissue that's very good for our bodies. So that would be like the ears and the feet yeah. Yeah. And, and those parts. Those are really loved. Um, and, and different cultures have, have many different preparations for those, you know, yeah. the Asian cultures we know about with the ears, but it, it's really widespread. Um, and I was just telling another person yesterday that in many parts where I go, uh, it doesn't matter if it's hunter gatherer or not, there's usually a fight over the feet. The children want the feet. And that is like the one time I see the moms put their feet down mm -hmm. and say, no, that's for me. <laughs> like <laughs> they really like it. So, um, I feel like that's so my house with bone marrow in yeah. my house. <laughs> There was years where I was like, no, I need this. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> With all good. the pregnancy stuff. But... Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So are, how are they preparing the feet? They're boiling it. And then they're just, yeah. it's really like, um, like jello to eat. It's just like, it's all different methods. I, okay. I would say that is the most delicious way. But when I'm with hunter gatherers, let's say they catch up. A medium sized rodent, so maybe unusually large size for us Americans, but Happy like the size for, yeah, for Africa. <laughs> exactly. And they'll just put that on the fire and kind of sear it. So a lot of it is still kind of raw, but the outside bits are a bit crispy. Uh, crispy. Yeah. And, and that's uh, very often how you'll get the feet as well. What about something like the trachea? Oh, yes. Or like these, like that. So again, that would be, I mean, it's like this big tube. It's kind of hard. Yeah. But even, uh, you know, I remember I was working at a nonprofit and there was a nun from Ireland and when I first met her, she made me a bowl of soup and she put that in because where she's from, that is what you give to the honored guest. Right. And that's just from Ireland now. So, yeah. so yeah, it is, it's a, a really common food to have, especially in soups, especially yeah. in chicken soup. Yes. And would the bits of it be consumed or it would be part, it wouldn't be just be part of the broth. It would actually be cut into small pieces and go into the soup and then be consumed as part of the soup. Things aren't aren't usually cut up okay the way that we do so it is cooked whole uh but then you take it out and you eat it like that so you would just so, take it with your hands yes you yeah would just yes gnaw on it yes is it still yes, tough this is such a good question soup everywhere else is so different than america because all the pieces it's just whole so you have like meat on bone how are you supposed to get at it with a spoon right. or with sipping you can't you have to pick things up with your hands is how it's done Okay. And in, so I know like, uh, I was in Nepal when I was younger and maybe India as well. Like if there's a definitive split between like right hand, left hand and how you use your hands in the culture. Right. I do see that in places like India and places that have, uh, semi-modernized as well, but the place I go, they're not dirty at all. And if they go to the mm -hmm. bathroom, it's clean. They don't need to wipe or anything. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's clean in a way that we don't understand. Dand. So yeah. yeah. So they, they don't have the sanitization issues really until, uh, modern things are brought in because they're, they're used to everything, uh, working within the ecosystem. So even when I lived in the Bahamas, it was a remote island. It wasn't a modern island, but even just living there, uh, the the locals they would just throw trash out the window because for you know decades of their life yeah anything they threw out the window either animals would scavenge or it would turn into soil and so you would see not massive piles but you would you would see these piles uh, of trash out the window uh, so so that's when you start to get sanitation issues and, right. and animals coming that shouldn't be coming and intermixing with our our species and all of that hmm. fascinating. Um, okay, so it, I, it's been such a pleasure talking with you, Mary. I Thanks. love diving deep on the nutrition nerdy stuff and also hearing these stories. It's so enlightening, but I hope that we have an opportunity to connect again. I want to like leave, that. tell me, um, before we leave off, I want you to tell me if there's been a time where even you were like really squeamish or grossed out or nervous or maybe a time where you had a faux pas yes. with some of these foods. <laughs> mm hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, like so many actually, uh, sometimes <laughs> just from the sheer quantity. So for instance, I was with uh, a community in Panama that I really liked and they heard through the grapevine that I really like tapioca, which I do. I really like tapioca and I rarely get to eat it. So they brought me the biggest bowl of just boiled tapioca, right? Cause that's how they eat it, but they eat a small amount. And so I had to sit there and eat like 10 pounds of boiled tapioca with no salt or flavoring. It was so, 
and I'm already ready to tend to eat less than other people. I eat a lot of fat, so I'm satiated, (laughs) you know, so my portions look silly to other people because they're usually small. So, so even had I just gotten like one root, it would have been a challenge. And so that, that was definitely one. I would say, uh, when in Mongolia eating horse, I I grew up around horses and I really love horses and I I know their traditional food. And now I'm used to it. I, I had horse in Japan too. And that kind of thing. It tasted delicious, but it was difficult for me to get around the mental aspect of it uh, and kind of to to break off from that. That was yeah. very hard. Luckily, I've never had to do dog. That is the thing that I always said I, I will not, <laughs> which I know it's just cultural. Right. But, you know, Absolutely. We, we all have our things. So yeah. so that was definitely one. Um, you know, there's been a few, actually. Uh, <laughs> I had. Uh, oh, and also, actually, at, it, on that same trip. The fat level was so high. And for your listeners, I, I've been in ketosis for the bulk of the last 15 years. So I, I eat a lot of fat, but it, it was so high that I almost threw up on the table. And I, I don't, I have an iron stomach. Like you, everyone around me could have E. coli and I'm just like, you know, singing to birds. I'm fine. Yeah. So, so that was definitely one. No, there was, there was something recently. We know what it was. Okay. I knew there was something because my whole... <laughs> Yes, because whenever I brought people on the trip, the thing that they compliment me on is always like, how did you keep a pleasant face eating these foods? And I'm like, I was just raised to. So like, it's just like it comes in, you know? And it, it's important. I could hurt the relationship if I'm not respectful. Right. So, uh, so I try to be very grateful before I eat the food so I get in the, the right state yeah. for it, even if it's not something I like. But I was doing uh, all these tastes of very specific bugs. And... Some bugs I really like, like uh, ants are fabulous, honestly, uh, termites as well, could easily live on those. But these were big beetles, at, like big, and they were very, very dry. And the last one that I had, the last one that I had, it had no moisture to it at all. And it was like eating a uh, glass. It just like stayed, sh- shards of it just stayed in your mouth. And mm-hmm. I... I did not keep a straight face. My mom would not have been proud. It was very difficult. <laughs> so very difficult. And it took, it was something that took like 20 minutes to fully get down just one beetle. And so that, that kind of like reflex just kept coming up. And I was like talking myself, like using all my mental tricks. Right. <laughs> yes. That would definitely be it. It was the beetle. Oh my gosh. But you haven't felt this with organ meats, like with the brain and the thymus. Like you had been eating these for a while already. You're familiar with them. You're appreciative. I have, but, them. but to be honest, they taste better when I'm with the groups and I love to cook, but yeah. they do them much better. Uh, they do brain a million times better and these kind of things. And then, oh, tell me uh, that really so yeah. quickly. Like what's the best yeah. preparation? Like, how do you, oh, which you could do because you get the whole animal. Like if you take the animal head and you poach it over a fire mm-hmm. or over a pot, mm-hmm. it makes it into like a custard. It's yeah. delicious. You don't need seasoning. You don't need anything. So that would definitely be my favorite way of having that. Amazing. That sounds so good. Thank yeah, you so much is. for taking the time, Mary. It's been such a pleasure talking with you <laughs> and hearing your stories. I can't wait to, you know, someday have an opportunity to go out and have you share some of these foods with me out in the world. So definitely. So that would be so fun. That. We must make so, that happen. I would love it. <laughs> good. Well, thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me to learn more about organ meats with Mary Reddick. If you want to learn more about how to prepare organ meats, I offer a free training that you would love. In this training, I break down some of the myths that keep people from exploring these sacred foods, such as the nutritional benefits and why they matter, how to cook any cut, and the number one mindset hack that people need to overcome their own squeamishness or picky eaters in their home. Find this free training at liverloverchallenge.com. See you there.